the Blues Brothers have to do with spaceflight? Good question. Okay, we're actually starting with a small company called Starstruck Inc. Starstruck was founded in 1982 by James Bennett and Phil Salen with the intention of building low-cost rockets and jump-starting serious commercial spaceflight opportunities. Oh, that's, that's a new one. Bennett had done considerable amounts of work on hybrid motors in the past. I, I can't find much detail in the goings-on at the company, I'm sorry. Based in Redwood City, the company planned to launch 6 to 12 of their Dolphin hybrid rockets to test and verify their hybrid motor concepts before building a four-stage orbital rocket named Constellation. Dolphin would be a sea-launched sounding rocket powered by a 35,000-pound thrust, liquid oxygen, hydroxyl-terminated polybutadiene engine. Sea launching was chosen for its simplicity and the ability to launch at any azimuth, echoing Robert Truax's early work with Sea Dragon. On August 3rd, 1984, Dolphin lifted off near San Clemente with a targeted apogee of 2.4 kilometers. Unfortunately, a valve for the thrust vector control got stuck, sending it off at a 45 degree angle. The flight was terminated and Starstruck ran out of money. Bennett wasn't stopped and co-founded American Rocket Company in 1985. Before getting to AMROC, we should stop and take a look at hybrid rocket motors. The two main chemical engines we see flying today are liquids and solids. Liquids have separate liquid oxidizer and fuel that are mixed in the combustion chamber. Solids have the oxidizer and fuel mixed together with a rubber binder. The motors themselves are a big combustion chamber with a nozzle at one end. Hybrids are a mix. One of the propellants is liquid and the other is a solid. Most of the time you see liquid oxidizer and solid fuel. The liquid oxidizer is injected along the grain of the solid fuel, which, after ignition, is vaporized along the boundary layer. It combusts with the oxidizer, heating up exhaust products and the exposed fuel grain, which then vaporizes. The benefit to hybrids over solids is that they can be shut down, as well as have throttling capabilities. Performance-wise, they are in between liquids and solids. Transporting the cast fuel grain is simpler than classic solids since the motor is just the fuel, not an explosive mix of oxidizer and fuel. Against liquids, hybrids have the advantage of being simpler. Less plumbing is needed since the fuel is ready. They also offer higher density impulse. That's about it on the liquid side. In terms of development, hybrids have been worked on since the 1930s. Several groups and organizations had worked with them, but they never got considered for orbital launch development. A notable group was the Pacific Rocket Society with the XDF family. XDF stood for Experimental Douglas Fir since they used the wood for fuel. Another is the AQM-81A Firebolt target drone developed by UTC for the Air Force. Back to AMROC. Two notable names involved with AMROC are Bevan McKinney, who would later end up at Rotary Rocket, and George Koopman, the founder and president. Koopman was the entrepreneurial type. One of his businesses did special effects for the Blues Brothers. Their mindset was minimum cost design, a launch vehicle that was the cheapest to develop and produce. Historically, MCD usually ended up with Big Dumb Booster, but this one was slightly different. Put simply, MCD is about getting the highest performance engine or structures, but the most affordable unit. They'd use commercial off-the-shelf components instead of specialized pieces. The industrial launch vehicle, as the first vehicle is called, was designed to be manufactured. Koopman gave a talk on the design process. If you can find it, do so. It's a great insight into practical minimum cost design of launch vehicles. The industrial launch vehicle would be a four-stage launcher that could carry 4,000 pounds, 1,814 kilograms, to a 28.5 degree orbit, or 3,000 pounds, 1,360 kilograms, into a polar orbit. Each stage would be powered by a LOX HTPB hybrid motor. Stage 1 would have a central LOX tank encircled by 12 motors. This would save development costs by having only one cryogenic tank instead of 12, according to the one paper available. It appears that the design was also aiming for an aero plug configuration, but I again couldn't find much detail on this aspect of the design. Stages 2 through 4 would be clusters of the same motor, which I can't find the performance figures on. 
Stage two would be four motors, stage three, two motors, and stage four is one motor that would carry payloads to low Earth orbit. Before orbit, AMROC would develop and test a wide array of hybrid motors at Edwards Air Force Base. These tests focused on small to large motors, the thrust vector control system, motor casings, engine materials, and a few other design aspects. George Koopman died in a car accident on his way to an engine test on July 19, 1989. AMROC not only proposed an orbital launch vehicle, but to manufacture strap-on boosters for the Delta, Titan, and future NLS vehicles. This led to the single-engine test flight in October 1989. Engine tests on the ground can only get you so far. You'll have to fly at some point. Set 1 was to be the first flight of the H-500 motor. 75,000 pounds of thrust, 253 seconds ISP, 300 psi chamber pressure, and an area ratio of 4. Set 1 would fly on a suborbital trajectory, carrying the Skid Blandner Parashield built by the University of Maryland. It's a heat shield concept. The countdown went smoothly and the engine started, but the vehicle didn't lift off from Vandenberg as planned. The liquid oxygen valve had moisture on it and froze, limiting the oxidizer flow to the engine to about 30% of what was needed, so the engine just sat there. For the flight computer, the rocket was flying and began a pitch maneuver. AMROC used liquid injection thrust vector control for steering. All this does is squirt oxidizer or another fluid into the nozzle, which causes thrust asymmetry that steers the rocket. The most notable example of this is the Titan III boosters. The big red tank is nitric acid. Set 1 used hydrogen peroxide, which was dumped through the nozzle and onto the hot pad where it decomposed into hydrogen and oxygen, catching fire, and burning through the boat tail. The motor then fell over. Luckily, minimal damage was done to the pad and booster. The pair's shield was recovered along with most of the avionics. After the Set 1 failure, AMROC redesigned their launch vehicle, which was renamed to Aquila. I could find four versions of the rocket, each with their own unique aspects. All four had two versions, Aquila 21 and 31. 21s had two boosters and a core, while 31s had three boosters and a core. Up first is the 1991 Aquila family. This one used the H-1500 motors to power the first and second stages. H-1500s had the following performance characteristics. 187,000 pounds of thrust in vacuum, a vacuum-specific impulse of 287 seconds, chamber pressures of 430 psi, and an area ratio of 10.8. The second stage variant had an area ratio of 17.9, leading to 297 seconds specific impulse and 194,000 pounds of thrust. Stage 3, a U250 motor, was powered by nitrous oxide and HTPB instead of LOX. This motor also eschewed pumps and went for a self-pressurizing pressure-fed system, since NOX can do that. Thrust would be 41,800 pounds, specific impulse of 288 seconds, have a chamber pressure of 356 psi, and have an area ratio of 64. Stage four, a U75 would operate in a similar manner. This one also operates with an ISP of 288 seconds, but with a chamber pressure of 349 psi, area ratio of 75, and 9,000 pounds of thrust. This Aquila 21 aimed to carry 1,400 pounds, 635 kilograms to a 90 degree polar orbit from Vandenberg. I couldn't find details on what the 31 could do. In the mix of all this is a suborbital rocket called High Flyer, which would have been an H-1500 booster plus payload. Next came another Aquila 21 and 31 at the end of 1991 or early 1992. These also used the H-1500 first and second stages. Stage 3 was changed from a hybrid motor to the Orbis 7 solid motor which is derived from the Minuteman III third stage. Stage 4 is another hybrid motor, the H-30. Again, it is a pressure-fed NOx HTPB system with 3,159 pounds of thrust, ISP of 287 seconds, an area ratio of 75.1, and a chamber pressure of 451 psi. This Aquila 21, the paper says 21, but then talks about the 31, could toss 3,200 pounds, 1,450 kilograms, to 185 kilometer, 28.5 degree orbit, or 2,500 pounds, uh, 1,134 kilograms, to a 90 degree polar orbit. 
1992, there was another design change, making another set of Aquilas. Again, the H-1500s were retained, while the upper stages were changed, and the payload fairing was widened to 92 inches in diameter. Stage 3 became an Orbis 21S motor, derived from the first stage of the inertial upper stage famously flown on the space shuttle. Stage 4 was another U-75 hybrid motor, 9,058 pounds of thrust, 288 seconds specific impulse, 451 psi chamber pressure, and an area ratio of 75.1. This Aquila 31 could toss 3,200 pounds, 1,450 kilograms, to a 90 degree, 185 kilometer polar orbit, while the 21 could do 2,500 pounds, 1,134 kilograms, to the same orbit. I don't know what this means for the previous Aquila 21 and 31 vehicle performance numbers. I'm sorry. By the end of 1992, there was the last Aquila design I can find. This time, the first and second stages are changed, but not the upper stages. The H-1500s were swapped out for H-1800s. Instead of using turbo pumps, the H-1800 was a helium pressure-fed system. First stage motors now operated at 373.5 PSI, had an area ratio of 9, ISP of 282 seconds, and a vacuum thrust of about 241,000 pounds of thrust. Second stage, H-1800s had an area ratio of 12.7, 288 seconds ISP, and a vacuum thrust of 265,000 pounds. Based on the technical paper, it seems AMROC determined turbo pumps would have been too expensive for their minimum cost design approach and switched to pressure fed. Aside from this change, the Aquila 21 and 31s would have had the same performance as the previous iterations. Now, Gunther's space page has two more Aquilas to add to this mix, but I couldn't find any technical papers on this. The first note in the description is that the U-75 motor was replaceable with the Orbis 7 motors, effectively making the upper stages an IUS. The other two Aquilas would be Aquila 1 and 421. Aquila 1 would have a single H-1800 first stage with the aforementioned upper stages, capable of tossing 217 kilograms to the 90 degree polar orbit. Aquila 421 would have four H-1800s on the first stage, two on the second and one as the third, with an Orbis 21S fourth stage. No payload data on this one. Oh, for reference, uh, this is what the renders should have looked like. I couldn't find concept art until after I'd made them. AMROC became insolvent in May 1996 and was shut down. From what it sounds like, George Koopman was a major driving force behind the company and his death caused it to deteriorate. They also seemed to have constant financial troubles, dooming them no matter what. The intellectual property was bought by Space Dev in 1999. This knowledge was used in the early work on Sierra Nevada's proposed Streaker, can't wait to cover that one, launch vehicle, and the early propulsion system for Dream Chaser. Space Dev also built the hybrid motors for Spaceship 1 and 2 for Burt Rutan and later Virgin Galactic. Despite failing, AMROC's work is going to be flying into the near future. As always, we have to ask if AMROC's vehicles would have worked. No idea on the ILV, so don't ask. With Aquila, it's hard to say. AMROC did hefty amounts of testing on a wide range of hybrid motors, which is saying a lot. However, aside from set 1, the one that failed, they never flew a single booster. There's a difference between test stand firings and actual in-flight behavior. Aside from the unknown in-flight behaviors of hybrid motors, the design seems reasonable. It's not much different than Conestoga or Percheron. The real technical issue faced by AMROC that I'm aware of is scaling up hybrid motors. Aside from the issues with grain regression rates and in multi-port fuel, a big problem is combustion stability. What happens is that droplets of liquid oxygen would pass through the pre-combustion chamber on top of the motor here and go along the fuel grain. These LOX droplets will then cause pressure waves in the combustion chamber, leading to combustion stability issues and poorer engine performance. Also, you can see how hybrids aren't exactly the best solution for low-cost engineering through the elimination of a LOX turbo pump and switching to pressure feds. If you can build a LOX turbo pump, you can build a fuel turbo pump and avoid the hassle of casting your fuel grain. Obviously, this falls under engineering trade studies, so I'm not going to go farther on it. Then there's the launch market. We don't know how cost-effective AMROC would have been with their design. With the first flight date set for 1995, Aquila would have come into the fray as the launch market collapsed. This is the same problem that Conestoga would have faced as well. One paper mentioned Aquila carrying Iridium satellites, so it could have gotten launches and competed with smaller Delta II payloads, 
but I'm not getting into alternate history. American Rocket Company was a pioneer in the private space world, developing some of the most powerful hybrid rockets ever built with the ultimate goal of a minimum cost design commercial launch vehicle. While they never got farther than failed flight tests, their legacy flies to this day. Amateurs, universities, and private companies worldwide work with hybrid motors. Some of them even intend to go to orbit. Amrock! That's a rocket company you know. 